If you and I know the way, why aren't we guiding people the way, the truth? And the way that they can have life and have it in abundance. To draw man back into ourselves, to draw them out of the hands of the enemy, to bring them back to your glory. Is there any other way? Testing. There it is. You guys hear me now? Sorry. I love that song and I guess I got up here. I just forgot to turn it on. <coughs> so today we're gonna we're gonna go this is wrong. Let's say seven forty nine. <laughs> it's only six forty nine, right? Yeah. Uh, now nah, that's okay. Um so these days that I have been really in prayer for for Israel, for Jerusalem, for their leadership. You know, I've really been praying for salvation and for peace. And as I was praying for peace, <clears throat> the Lord gave me a thought. And, uh, and that thought I found in Matthew 10. So let's go to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10. We're going to do verses 34 through 39. <clears throat> Excuse my voice, guys. Yes, 34, chapter 10, 34 through 39. You know when you got it, guys. The word of the Lord says, do not think, this is Jesus speaking, do not think that I came to bring peace on earth. I did not come to bring, bring peace, but a sword. For I have come to set a man against his father, a daughter against her mother, a daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's enemies will be those of his own household. He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross, <coughs> I'm sorry, who does not take his cross and follow me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Isn't that amazing that <clears throat> Jesus said that he didn't come to bring peace. He did not come to bring peace, but a sword. Wow. So in, in, in Matthew, uh, in these verses that we just read, it describes Jesus telling his disciples that he came not to bring peace to the world, but a sword. And Jesus' sword, sword was never a literal one. In fact, when Peter took up a sword to defend Jesus in the garden, Jesus rebuked him and told him to put away his sword. He said, for all who draw the sword will die by the sword. It's funny because <clears throat> when they came to arrest Jesus in the garden and Peter picked up his sword and he swung it, he chopped off the ear <laughs> of one of the Roman soldiers. And it's funny because like he was a fisherman, he thought he was filleting a fish, you know, whoosh, <laughs> just the ear, you know, instead of just like going straight for the heart or the gut. No, he filleted one of the ears off. <laughs> that just goes to show that Peter was a hardcore fisherman. So why then did Jesus say, do not suppose that I have come to bring peace to the earth? I did not come to bring peace, but a sword. So what kind, of, what kind of sword is Jesus talking about that he came to bring? Among the names of Jesus is the Prince of Peace. And I had a thought as I was studying this today, and because that's exactly one of the thoughts I had. Well, in, in the book of Isaiah, it says he's the Prince of Peace. And uh, see, he didn't come to bring peace. 
he is peace. And those of us who are in him will have peace no matter what we're going through. But those that are in the world and, and, and rebel and refuse to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, Messiah, and King and Lord, they don't have peace like we do. Because we can go through all kinds of things and we have peace. You know, for the first time in, in quite a while, <laughs> yesterday morning I was listening to news. On, and it's the, the Newsmax on, on the phone. I don't watch the TV news. This is real news, true news. But it was just saying how people are in a panic because the economy and people are foreclosing on their homes. And, I mean, just all kinds of stuff going on. And, and it's like, well, we're not in the economy of the world. As long as we trust the Lord, the, the Lord with our finances, we're in the economy of the Lord. Because I don't know about you guys, but everything that's going on in the world, I don't feel a panic. I don't feel a panic. You know, we, we have that mentality that, you know what, if we were to lose all of the material things on earth, we would still have that peace because nobody can take that away from us. Nobody can take the joy of the Lord away from us. We don't find our joy in the things that we own. We find joy in the one who owns it. Such verses as Isaiah 9, 6 and Luke 2, 14 and John 14, 27 make it very clear that Jesus came to bring peace. But that peace is between man and God. Those who reject God and the only way of salvation through Jesus, as in John 14, 6, will find themselves at war with God. See, this is why we have peace, because we're not at war with God. Our lives aren't perfect. We don't get up in the morning and everything's just perfect. You know, things happen. Things happen. Sometimes, you know, we're upset with our family members, sometimes with our co-workers, sometimes with the person that just cut us off on the freeway. I mean, we're not, we're not perfect, guys. But we have a perfect peace because we serve a perfect God. You know, and, and, and this is why I was saying last Wednesday that you know, though I got really, really sick for my birthday and ended up in the hospital, I had peace. Yes, I was struggling to breathe, but you know what? I had peace. Because whether I breathe here or I breathe in the other world in the presence of God, I know where I'm going. I know where I'm going to spend eternity. I had peace. I think the doctors and the nurses and, and uh, the man that came to give me breathing treatments, I think they were more nervous than me, you know, because my blood pressure was high and everything. But I was just laying there. I had peace. And that's a beautiful peace that nobody can take away from us. Those who come to Jesus Christ in repentance will find themselves at peace with God. Because of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, we are restored to a relationship of peace with God. Let's go, go to Hebrews um, chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, guys. We're going to go to verses 12 and 13. My poor Bible. All the pages already stick together. I have, I have other Bibles at home. <laughs> I just can't give this one up. Chapter 4, Hebrews 4, verses 12 and 13. For the word of God is living and powerful and sharper than any to its sword, piercing even the division of the soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. And there is no creature hidden from his sight, but all things are naked and open to the eyes of him to whom is given account. Wow. See, the word of God is a double-edged sword. On one side, it can bring you peace when you are purposing to walk with God, when you are purposing to not sin, when you are purposing to take addictions out of your life, when you're purposing to put him above all things. It can bring peace. 
But then there's times sometimes we can act like rebellious children or rebellious grandchildren. And you get into the word, and then the Lord starts correcting us, right? And it's happened to me many times. There's been times where I'm frustrated, I'm tired, I'm, you know, and, and, and I even get on my own nerves, you know, and then I get in the word, and the Lord's correcting me through his word. But he corrects me with love. Why? Because the thing we have to remember, guys, as long as you're being corrected by the word of God, you're being corrected by the Holy Spirit. That proves that you're still a child of God. When you can sin and not feel no remorse and the Holy Spirit's not prompting you, better check your salvation. Because when we do wrong, the Holy Spirit will always immediately call it to our attention. Immediately. And that's what Jesus means, that he brought a sword. He didn't come to bring peace. He came to bring the sword. That sword not only divides our thoughts and intents of the heart, but it's going to divide the sheep from the goat, the wheat from the chaff. It's, it's, it's bringing division. Unfortunately, there's a lot of division in the church, and that's not the way that God intended it to be. But again, even in the church, because in this last hour, judgment's going to come, and it's going to come first to the house of God. And that, that sword is going to come. And many times it doesn't cause division, but it separates from us what God needs to separate from us. There's been many times, many times when during the new year that we start our 21-day fast and we seek the Lord for this new year. Lord, what do you want for this new year for the ministry? Where do we go? What do we do? What ministries do we support? We, we ask the Lord all these things because this is his ministry, not ours. We're only his servants. And another prayer that we, we make during those 21 days of fasting is, Lord, if there's anyone here in the congregation who is causing division, who is not equally yoked with us and with you, and has bad intentions or no good intentions with this ministry, take them out, Lord. And I'll guarantee you, every January, we lose anywhere from 10 to 20 people. But we know it's the Lord. He has to do, he does what he has to do to protect his bride. Because the Lord is not going to put up with gossiping and slander and all of these things, pointing of the finger within his eye. So as we begin, to, every year we do this, and every year, every year the Lord has taken people out. But that's our heartfelt prayer for 21 days. Anyone who is not equally yoked with us and with you and what you have sent us to do in this ministry, separate them from us. And lo and behold, he does. He's faithful. But see, he knows the hearts of the people. We don't. And just like many of us, sometimes we trust somebody that betrays us, and we're like, man, why didn't I see it? Because, see, we can't see the intents of the heart like God does. Still, still there will be conflict between good and evil, the Christ and the Antichrist, the light and the darkness. The children of God as believers and the children of the devil. And those, the children of the devil, are those who refuse to accept Jesus Christ as the only begotten Son of God Almighty. So conflict must arise between these two groups. This is where the sword comes in. This is it. Because this is what the sword divides. It divides the good and the evil. The Christ from the Antichrist or the Christians from the non-Christians the light from the darkness and the children of God from the children of Satan. See, a lot of people say, we're all children of God. No, we're not. We're all the creation of God. We don't become children of God until we repent with all of our hearts and ask Jesus Christ to come and take ownership of our lives. And then we begin to follow him and we begin to serve him. Then are we children of God. So conflict must arise between these two groups. 
And this can and does happen even within our own family, which some are believers and some are not. And, and we can testify to this, that some of our family members, no matter how close or how distant, that don't believe in Jesus Christ, it causes conflict. So now Thanksgiving is coming up and you're like, oh, we know there's going to be some kind of conflict, right? Because the whole family gets together and not everybody agrees and, you know, and then we go hold hands and say grace and you have those that roll their eyes or whatever, you know. And, and especially during the holidays, and you're kind of like, geez, man, but how do I write everybody in my family, <laughs> you know? And, and so you kind of think about it because it kind of causes tension. But that's what the Word of God does. We should seek to be at peace with all men, but should never forget that Jesus warned us that we will be hated for his sake. Because those who reject him hate us. Because they hate him. Let's go, guys, to Psalms. Psalms 149.6. Psalms 149.6. I just passed it. This is what the Lord says about us. Let the high praises of God be in their mouth and a two-edged sword in their hand. We should always have the sword in our hand. Always. You never let down your guard. We are in a battle, guys. We're in a war. There's evil out there. There's darkness that hates us. Why? It just hates us because we're light, because we love Jesus. So we must never put down that two-edged sword. We always have to have it in our hands. But with that, we have to have the praises of God in our mouths because we have to give the world Jesus, but we have to do it in love. We can't be hateful about it. You know, I've, uh, <clears throat> I've lost two jobs. <laughs> I've lost two jobs because I'm a Christian. And the first job I lost, it, it was a company that claimed to be a Christian company. They told me when I was hired that I could take any reading materials with me in the times that we were busy in between customers that we could read whatever we took. So I would take my Bible. And I, there was never a problem. I was there for about a year, a year and a half. There was never an issue. Every break, every time there was no customers, we were slow. I was in the Word, and I was in the Word, and, and just, it was so, uh, it was so beautiful because at the same time, there was a woman who worked with me who had lost a son in a really bad accident, her only son. And I remember one day she walked into my booth, and she was really mad. And she's like, you're always reading that Bible. She goes, do you really believe that God exists? I said, yes, I do. She goes, he took my son. My, own, my only son, I had one son and he took him. He said, if God is love, why do you take my son? He goes, answer me one question. If God truly believes, you can answer me this question. Where was God when my son was dying? And this was all Holy Spirit. I didn't even have to think about it. It just came out of my mouth. I said he was sitting in the exact same place that he was when his son was dying. But his son was dying for you and your son and everyone else. God knows what you're going through. But you have to surrender to him. And she walked out of my booth all angry. But the next day her attitude was different towards me. And she finally got an answer to the question. She got an answer to the question. See, God doesn't want bad things to happen in our life. He doesn't take our children to hurt us. But our children, just like us, make choices. They make decisions. I've lost a lot of family members. I can't blame God. They made really bad choices in their life. Your body can only take so many drugs, so many alcohol, so much other things, you know, and, and we've all made choices, and I thank God, I thank God that my family members, before they passed away, I was able to minister to them, and they gave their life to the Lord, 
they knew the truth, and it might have been right at their deathbed or a few days before they died. But I have that peace. See, I have that peace. That knowing that someday when I get to heaven, I'm going to have a relationship with my siblings that I never had here on earth. And it's a beautiful thing to have that security. You know, some of us put our security in, in our 401 or our retirement or whatever. The government can declare bankruptcy and all that's gone in a moment. That's not secure. But the love and joy and peace that God gives us, that's secure in our minds and our hearts and our lives. In Matthew chapter 10, Jesus said that he came not to bring peace to earth, but to bring a sword, a weapon, which divides and severs. As a result of his visit to earth, some children would be set against their parents, and a man's enemies might be those of his own household. This is because many will choose to follow Christ, because many who will choose to follow Christ are hated by some of their family members. This may be in part because of the discipleship, the cost of discipleship that we will pay for picking up our cross and following the Lord. Some of us don't even have peace in our own home because some of us love Jesus and are either our spouse or our children or our grandchildren don't. So it causes strife, it causes tension, it causes division. But that's okay because we should not allow that to take our peace. Many people are envious of us because they can see us go through a difficult trial in our life, but yet we pick up our cross and we follow Jesus with a smile on our face. And that angers them even more because they want to rub you the wrong way. We must be faced, we must be willing to face not only family hatred, but also death if necessary like a criminal carrying the cross to his own execution. That's what we are. See, Satan hates us. The demons come after those of us who are carrying our cross because they can spot us a mile away. True followers of Christ must be willing to give everything up, even to the point of being hated by everyone around us, even our own family, if we are able to be worthy of him. In doing so, we find that our lives in return for having giving, given up everything to Christ, we have that perfect peace. Not the peace that the world gives, but the peace that Jesus died for us to have. Let's go to Romans 13, 4, guys. Romans 13, 4. The word of the Lord says, For he is God. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid. For he does not bear the sword in vain, for he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practice evil. Wow. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Vengeance is mine, says the Lord. I will repay. No matter what people do to us, and when it's our family, it hurts. It really does. But no matter what they do to us, we pray for them. It was so hard. I'm going to be totally honest. It was so hard for me to begin to pray for my ex-husband. After all the abuse, 
And because of the abuse, I lost my little girl. It was hard for me to pray for him. And because of all the affairs, all the beatings, all the times he hospitalized me, it was hard. Pastor, my husband, my pastor is the one that took me aside one day and said, Babe, you've got to let go of that. We have to begin to pray for him. We have to pray for his salvation. The man that before Jesus <laughs> had a word with him and told him, if you even think of my wife, I'll kill you. Because he, he knew the abuse I had gone to through at the hands of this man. And it was so hard. I'll tell you, that first time I prayed for him, it was forced. It was kind of like, well, I have, I have to. Okay, so God, uh, God bless him. Make sure he doesn't hit, get hit by a train. I mean, it was kind of like just something, <laughs> just real forced, you know. And as I began to just pray and release forgiveness and, and, and just really ponder on the fact that this man, if there's no change in his life, is going to spend eternity in hell. It was only about three days ago, as a matter of fact, that I prayed for him with all my heart. And why did I pray for him with all my heart? Because I didn't want all the sin that he's involved in to follow my children. So I have to stand in the gap with that double-edged sword and say, I forgive him. And because I forgive him, I have the power with this sword that I have in my hand to cut those generational curses of alcohol, cocaine, abuse, infidelity, everything, so that they don't follow my children. So I have to stand here in the gap and cut those curses, pray for his salvation, but know that those curses can no longer follow my children and my grandchildren because I chose to forgive and I chose to pray for him. And that's a beautiful thing when you begin to see when you begin to see the minds and the hearts of your children begin to change. And they begin to ask questions. At one time they'll say, Yeah, 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 whatever, whatever. But now they begin to ask questions. And I know that the Lord is faithful. And I know that He's gonna do the work in my children that I have been longing for for years. Let's go to Revelation chapter 1, and I'll begin to close with this. Revelation chapter 1. And we're going to read verses 12 through 16. Verses 12 through 16. See, it doesn't always feel good to pray for people who have hurt you, people who have abandoned you, mistreated you, slandered you. Pastor, I don't care how many times he changes his phone number, somehow people that don't like him get it, and he gets some really ugly messages. You know what we do? We just ignore them. We just ignore them because you know what? Children of God are not to bring their, their selves down to the level of stupidity that other people have no respect and the reason he has so many enemies is because he has brought correction. He's brought correction. He's, you know what, I, I love you and I'm going to tell you in love that you're wrong about this or you're wrong being in this or, or this. Or, and then they take offense and they leave and they slander his name and they talk about him and they send him horrible text messages or on Facebook or on Messenger or you name it. But that's okay. We can just stand afar back. We don't have to say anything or respond. Because we know that God is going to avenge those who have hurt us wrongfully. Even King David, when Saul was trying to kill him, King David did not raise a hand or an ugly word towards the king. God forbid that I should raise my hand against one of God's anointed. That's something that should bring fear and trembling to people, but it doesn't because we live in a world that, that really don't respect anymore. I don't know about you guys, but 
at this point in my life, all I want is peace. I don't care about a fancy house or a new car or diamonds or I, I don't care about that stuff. There comes a point in your life where all you want is peace, just peace. Just, I want my family to get along. I want my children to get along. I just want peace. You come to a point in your life where you understand that that's the most important thing that you can have in your life, and that nothing can buy it. Nothing, no amount of money can buy the feeling of peace. Pastor and I have such a feeling of peace in our home that when people go and visit us, his nephew went one time and said, Uncle, like, I don't even want to leave. I feel so much peace in this house. Like, can I just sit here on the couch for a while? And it's like, wow. That, that's at this point in life, we just want peace. It's like, you know what? I don't care about all that mitote and the gossip and just, just peace. Just peace. And it's a good thing because we serve the Prince of Peace. But he did come to bring the sword. He did, and he will, return to avenge sin and those who have destroyed the earth. In Revelation 1, beginning in 12, this is John speaking. He said, Then I turned to see a voice that spoke with me. And having turned, I saw seven golden lampstands. And in the midst of the seven lampstands, one like the Son of Man, clothed with a garment down to the feet and girded about the chest with a golden band. His head and hair were white like wool, as white as snow, and his eyes like flames of fire. His feet were like fine brass, as if refined in a furnace, and his voice as the sound of many waters. He had in his right hand seven stars, and out of his mouth went a sharp two-edged sword. And his countenance was like the sun shining in all of its strength. That's amazing. That is so beautiful. I'm going to go to Jude 16, 24, and 25, and I'm going to close with this. And I wasn't going to, this wasn't in my notes, but the Lord just pointed it out to me. Jude 16, 24, and 25. And it's the book right before Revelation. It says, Now to him, meaning Jesus, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, and to present you faultless before the presence of his glory with exceeding joy. To God our Savior, who alone is wise, be glory and majesty, dominion and power, both now and forever. Amen. Isn't that beautiful? You know, as we pray for the peace and the salvation of Jerusalem, just remember that with it, the Lord is bringing a sword. And a sword on his people who have rejected him time and time again. There are many Christian Jews, many who have come to the Lord already. But the Lord is gathering them back to Jerusalem that they can minister to the other Jews who are yet waiting for the Messiah. They don't believe that Jesus is the Messiah. They're still waiting for the coming Messiah. We have to pray for their spiritual eyes to be open. We have to pray for their salvation. But we have to pray for a personal peace, that they can feel that personal peace that comes through Jesus Christ. But we have to remember again what the Lord says in his word. If you love your mother and father more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you love your children more than me, you are not worthy of me. If you love anything more than me, you are not worthy of me. And in another part of the Bible, it says, He who has put his hand to the plow turns back. In other words, he who has begun to serve the Lord, the plow, you're tilling the ground. And you turn back, you backslide. You are not worthy of the plow. Jesus didn't turn back. When he was carrying that cross full of our junk, full of our filth, full of our sin, 
when he could have just thrown that cross to the side and called legions of angels to just come and destroy everyone? He didn't turn back. He kept on all the way faithful, even to death and death of the cross, which was the most shameful way that he could have died. Because we see pictures of Jesus on the cross. And there are some pictures that you see, and there's this skinny Jesus with one drop of blood, and he's covered up. It's not Jesus. Jesus was beat beyond recognition. His mother recognized him only because she followed him through the whole thing. His flesh was hanging off of his bones. They crucified him naked on that cross. He wasn't covered like it shows in the pictures. Why? Because what was Satan trying to do? He was trying to shame him. Do you remember in the garden, Adam and Eve were naked. But when they sinned, they immediately made coverings with fig leaves. Why? Because when the Lord came and said, Adam, where are you? He said, I hid because I heard you in the garden and I was ashamed because I was naked. Who told you you were naked? So they hung Jesus naked on that cross with the flesh hanging off of his bones. And then to mock him, they put a crown of thorns on his head and said, Hail the king. It was not a pretty scene. And I can tell you one thing, and I bet you that Mary was remembering this day at the foot of the cross, watching her son take his last breath. When the angel Gabriel came to him and said, Mary, you are highly favored of God. She's probably thinking, is this highly favored? I gave birth to the Messiah. I raised him. I took care of him. And now I have to watch him here dying a shameful death naked on a cross while people pass by and mock him. See, sometimes we have favor of God and it's not what we think it should be. It's not all roses and, and a white picket fence and a spotted dog. No, it's not. Because we're followers of Jesus Christ. We're going to be persecuted. We're going to be hated. We're going to be mocked. We're going to be spit on. We're going to be slandered. We're going to be gossiped about. Why? Because you're too radical. I mean, you have to leave some room because nowadays in the world, the, the, the greatest saying right now is love is love. You got to love him. Yes, you got to love them. But Jesus Christ is love. You have to love them enough to bring him Jesus Christ. You have to love him enough to bring him the word. You have to love him enough to bring him the sword and say, if you don't change your ways, you're going to end up in hell for all eternity. And those are some harsh words that not everybody wants to preach from the pulpit because we don't want to scare people away. Because they might stop tithing. They might stop giving. You know what? This ministry is provided. Everything is provided by God himself. Why? We appreciate that you guys give. We thank you that you give. This is how the ministry goes forth. But you give because every morning God has provided breath in your lungs. Because a dead person doesn't go to work. So we can never forget that. Everything comes from God. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, Lord. Lord, we thank you for your word, Heavenly Father. Lord, many times, Lord, your word pierces us like a sword, Heavenly Father. But it does so because we're your children and you love us, Lord. You correct us when we need to be corrected, Heavenly Father. See, sometimes pride tries to raise up in us. And we think that we can do it on our own. But we can do nothing apart from you, Lord. You are our everything. You are the king of the universe. You laid down the life of your own son that you might reconcile us to have a relationship with you. How can we ever repay that? 
but to give you our heart and our life and to serve you and to pick up our cross daily, to follow the example that Jesus Christ set for us, that we will not give up. No matter how many times we are rejected or mocked, we will continue carrying our cross until you call us home. Lord, thank you for your word, Heavenly Father. Thank you. Thank you so much for your word, Heavenly Father. It's our life. It's every beat of our heart. We cannot be separated from you because like Peter said, we won't leave you, Lord, because where would we go? You have the words of life. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for dividing this message in as many ways as is needed. Lord, we lift up Israel to you right now, Jerusalem, Heavenly Father. We lift up the Jews. We lift up the leaders, Heavenly Father. We lift up everyone who is involved in this war, Lord. Yes, we pray for peace, Heavenly Father, but we know that peace doesn't always come in the manner in which we expect it to come. And I know that right now, Heavenly Father, even through this battle in Israel, you are separating the sheep from the goats. Thank you, Heavenly Father that you have not left us ignorant, but you have prophesied in your word things to come, Heavenly Father. And this is just another prophecy that's coming to pass. But we do pray for the salvation, Heavenly Father, of the Jews, Heavenly Father. Lord, we thank you, Heavenly Father. We thank you for our Christian brothers and sisters all around the world who are being persecuted for the word, but they continue to take your word into dark places, Heavenly Father. Protect them, bless them, let your word go forth, Heavenly Father, from their lips. Send angels to surround them, Heavenly Father. Lord, I thank you. As I always do, Lord, I thank you for my husband. I thank you, Heavenly Father, that he allows me to bring forth your word, Lord, as he's under your authority and your protection. He brings me under your protection as well, Heavenly Father. So I thank you, Lord, for him. I ask that you bless him with a long life, with health, protect him, Heavenly Father. Surround him with the fire of the Holy Spirit, Lord, that no evil thing, no disease will touch him, but he will be healthy. He will live and he will proclaim the wonderful works of God. Surround him with godly men, Heavenly Father, faithful men, Lord, who will always watch out for him, encourage him, uplift him, Heavenly Father. And at times when he needs it, men who will help him carry his cross if it gets too heavy, Lord. Thank you, Heavenly Father. Once again, as we go our separate ways, I ask that you protect everyone as they go home, Heavenly Father. Send angels before them and behind them, Lord. Allow them to get home safely, Heavenly Father. And as they lay their head to rest, Lord, I pray that you give them sweet sleep. Give them beautiful dreams, Heavenly Father that they might wake up tomorrow refreshed and renewed and just ready to continue in this battle. Thank you, Abba Father, for everything. Thank you, Jesus. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus, for your life, for your sacrifice. Thank you for taking our place on that cross. Thank you for just reconciling us to your Father. Thank you that we have the opportunity to have that perfect peace no matter what we're going through because of the sacrifice that you made on that cross. We honor you and we bless you. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In the precious name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen. Good morning. How's everybody doing? Everybody doing good? Man, it feels like I haven't been here forever. Man, it was, it was good. It's good to be back. Amen. We had a good time. Well, she had a good time. I'm not just kidding. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> Oh, uh, yeah. And then she could pay for it. Amen. So awesome to be back in the house of the Lord. Amen. 
Wow, what a, I just want to thank, uh, thank you all, thank uh, Juanita and Phil for, for opening and taking care of things here while we were gone, and a special thank you to Pastor Paul and Pastor Jeremy, we're, we're, ain't they awesome, huh, yeah, they're awesome, and, and um, well, God is good, and also, you know, yesterday we celebrated Veterans Day, um, Man, I'm so thankful and grateful for our veterans, those that have gone before us and those that are here. I mean, I, I honestly believe and think that our veterans shouldn't be begging for bread, you know. I think our government, if any people they should be taking care of, it's our veterans. You know what I'm saying? They shouldn't be, they should be housed, they should be fed, they should be whatever it is that they need. I believe that our veterans should should be the first on the list because because of their sacrifice, because of what they have done. We're here today. We're able to preach the word of God freely because men and women sacrificed their life way before we even existed to so that we can be able to stand for our faith and what we believe in and the morals and I'm just so grateful for them, you know, but I've always had a, I've always honored our veterans, but when, when my nephews and my nieces joined the military, it was so much different. It was so much different when my nephew and my, when my nephews were overseas and one of my nephews served a couple tours in Afghanistan. It became surreal to me now. So, I mean, I've always honored our veterans, but it just was more personal now. And now I see the, the real sacrifice that had been made. And when I talked to my nephew about it, he said that he would do it all over again if he had to. Why? Because of the freedoms you and I take for granted on a daily basis. Following up that with the message today, we have to understand the freedom that Christ has given us because of the sacrifice that's already been paid at the cross for us. The freedom that we have to worship Him, the freedom that we have to honor Him, even in the midst of adversity, because we're all going through adversity at one time. If we're coming out of one, we're entering one. But all of us are in that in that part of life right now. So that's the title of the message today. So let's go to the Lord and pray. Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we just, first and foremost, Father God, we lift up all of our veterans that are living. We lift up those, um, the families of those veterans that have gone. I just pray right now, Father God, that you would bring peace in their lives, in their household. Father, and those that are here, Father God, let them know how much we appreciate them, how much we honor them, how much we love them, how much we're grateful for them, Heavenly Father. That they've, the sacrifices that they have made on our behalf, Heavenly Father. Help us to honor that and not take it for granted, Heavenly Father. But first and foremost, we want to thank Jesus for being that ultimate sacrifice for us, that he gave it all up so that we can have life. So this morning, we thank you, we praise you. Holy Spirit, we just invite you here, and we thank you. And we ask that you would lead and guide this morning in your word that's truth. Amen? Amen and amen. Praise God. So, man, we almost got snowed in in Colorado Springs. It was crazy man i thought i was gonna have to put chains on the car and everything you know what i'm saying but thank god that um everything god bless you and thank you for watching